In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Years ago, I was asked to introduce the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Runcie, at a banquet where he was the dinner speaker in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I told Lord Runcie beforehand, uh, I didn't want to just do one of these sort of resume introductions, but to do something fun and different. I suggested perhaps using a war story from his days with the Scots Guards as a tank commander in World War II. That sounded like a good source of information to me. Uh, so he told me the story about actually capturing a U-boat out in the water from his tank, which was on the beach. Uh, so I told the story the way only someone who is used to inflating war stories is able to do. Uh, when I had finished and Lord Runcie took to the podium, he asked if I would return home with him to convince his wife, Lindy, that he was indeed a valiant and courageous war hero. Well, there's nothing like a good war story by which one can prove their power and commitment and character. And this is exactly the purpose of this wonderful war story from Judges, one of my favorite lessons. But in this story, it was ultimately important that the power, the victory, the deliverance be clearly attributed to Israel's God and not to Gideon and his men, lest they think more highly of themselves than they ought to, uh, their disobedience thus vindicated, that they then fail to repent and truly become in the end God's people. The first indication that God was to be their only hope was when Gideon instituted the very first draft. Uh, the people of Israel had become been a disobedient lot. Uh, they were emotionally self-indulgent and anxious, ripe really for somebody to, uh, to take charge of them uh, for enslavement and oppression. Two-thirds, 22,000 of those eligible to fight were too afraid and faint-hearted to continue. So they fled to their safe places where trauma specialists were ready uh, to comfort them. As if there really is, in fact, any safe place for those afraid to remain steadfast in the face of challenges to their convictions, uh, for those not willing to fight for what they love and believe. Um, I would suggest to you that nothing much has changed from the time of Gideon among some of those who fancy it themselves God's blessed. I remember in the spring of 1969, traveling in a bus full of young men to a military induction center to be examined for our physical fitness to serve. Uh, some of these guys were taking aspirin by the handful and drinking Coca-Colas to raise their blood pressure. Others were stuffing themselves with donuts and candy to raise their blood sugars to avoid the draft. I was, on, I was one of only a handful on that bus who actually passed the physical in all my 5 foot 10, 110 pound glory. As our president-elect would say, sad, very sad. <laughs> Of course, I always think a good draft and military service is exactly what people need to shake them into reality. Uh, given the reports of college students today feeling unsafe, can you imagine what would happen if they received a letter uh, that said, report for duty at the top of it? For Gideon, even the 10,000 men who were not just afraid, uh, they lacked the sense of urgency and anticipation necessary to fight successfully in a war. To weed those out, the Lord told Gideon to take them to the water. The men who bent down to drink, to get a drink, were not alert. They put themselves in a vulnerable position. They were not alert and expectant to the, about the prevailing danger. So they were not fit to fight and were sent away. The men who stooped in a position ready to spring up and cup their hands 
The lappers, like dogs, as scripture reports them to be, were alert and observant and ready to fight, leaving Gideon with just 300 men to go against a number somewhere around 135,000 Midianite warriors. Could there ever be a lesson for the third Sunday of Advent uh, better than this, that those finally fit to fight for God are those who are fearless, alert, expectant, watching, exactly what we are called to be, having a posture of expectancy that our Lord is coming among us, that he will be victorious for us. Uh, For all of us, it is this hope and potential to change from being anxious, fearful, disinterested, neglectful, and slothful to being, to becoming alert, expectant, watchful, prepared, productive. That is the change to which we are called in this season of Advent. Not dissimilar to troops arriving at boot camp. Uh, I was watching clips from Stripes last night, and and John Candy, who's heavy, tells the troops that um, he's heavy because he swallows his aggression. Uh, And... (laughs) And that, uh, and that his doctor recommended that he go to EST training, anger management training. And he couldn't afford the $400, so he saw the Army had a six-week program <laughs> so that was free, and he signed up for it. Uh, and that he hoped to leave that program a clean, a lean, mean fighting machine. Um, it's pretty funny, really. The word, not realizing, of course, that he had then a two-year commitment to go to Vietnam afterwards. <laughs> the word, of course, we use to describe this activity, uh, the process of Advent change, to become expectant and watchful is metanoia, to repent. Uh, last Sunday, Jesse and I were with Brenda uh, and Julian Dobbs, and we had communion uh, in the morning around our kitchen table, and Bishop Dobbs talked about metanoia coming from the same root as metamorphosis, as in metamorphic rock, changing from one type to another, like a clump of carbon becoming a valuable diamond. That is what God affects within us through our repentance, this metanoia transforming us by his presence in word and prayer from anxious to fearless, from weak to strong, from slothful to productive, from faithful, uh, from, to, from faithlessness to faithful. Uh, but God in this specific event in the book of Judges had yet another motive for winnowing the troops. It was a time in history that the people of Israel who had been cruelly oppressed as a direct result of their own disobedience needed to clearly understand themselves that their deliverance from oppression would only happen by God's own divine intervention. As Salvian, an early church father, wrote, the Lord left only 300 fighters to fight against countless thousands of barbarians in order that their fewness would not permit them to realize any credit from the prosecution of the divinely waged war. The story of the actual battle was clearly the model for the opening scene of the movie Apocalypse Now, blasting the ride of the Valkyries from speakers mounted on their helicopters as 1st Cavalry Air Division helicopters attacked a strong, an army stronghold. As Gideon and his men came to the outskirts of the Midian camp, they blew their trumpets and broke their jars, yelling a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the Midianite army uh, screamed in terror and fled. The preparation of Gideon's men and their strength for battle was grounded, you see, in their expectancy and conviction that the Lord was with them to accomplish his will to the point that the Lord's purposes had become their own purposes. This is what we are undergoing in this season of Advent, a metanoia, a change a transformation from hunks of carbon to brilliant and priceless diamonds with an expectancy, an attitude, an outlook, a perspective, a discipline of expectancy that the Lord will act 
and the Lord's purposes will become our purposes and they will in fact be fulfilled. But what of God's actions in times of war? I mean, we've really got a complicated subject there. How do we believe in the goodness of God while seeing the devastation resulting from his role as commander-in-chief? Reginald Fuller, my New Testament professor, uh, in his book, uh, The Book of the Acts of Gods, explains it this way. He says, The biblical understanding is that war exists because of human sin. And God uses human agents to accomplish his purposes in history. When he does so, he does not add up the agent's degrees of righteousness. The agent God understands is always tainted by sin. But God uses the agent anyhow for his purposes. Deuteronomy says this precisely. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of the land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God does what he does for two reasons, to punish the wicked and to fulfill his promise. God's purpose was and is the redemption of the sinful world and he makes even wars that are caused by human sin to fulfill his final purpose. This is what scripture describes. On the one hand, God's control and direction of history to his own ends and on the other hand, the sin of humanity for which humanity itself must be responsible. So we live in this tension the sovereign goodness of God and the freedom God allows humanity. God then is not responsible when in this freedom humanity commits atrocities. But these atrocities which stem from our own fear and weakness do serve God's purposes to prove the need for the strength and goodness of God to redeem us. Well, in celebration of Army's victory over Navy (laughs) yesterday, Robert and I have a story about a Navy submarine guy, but I won't won't digress uh, into that story. Uh, And given that Scripture itself uses war stories to make the point, Gideon uh, puts me in remembrance of my own first combat mission. Uh, As we flew into a landing zone to attack uh, a VC stronghold, um, it was really quite intense for my first day in Vietnam with Cobra gunships firing rockets and exploding all around us and 60 caliber machine guns firing in the tree line at such rapid rate that they were cutting down trees. Um, I remember feeling then something all of a sudden searing and seemingly wet on the back of my neck, uh, being the hypochondriac and Um, catastrophic thinker that I am, Um, I figured I had been shot and was paralyzed for life on my very first mission. Um, Reaching down into the back of my shirt, I pulled out three hot uh, 60 caliber shell casings which were fired from the machine gun right behind me. Um, (laughs) Thus learning why we have these Velcro strap turtleneck things on our flight suits. But it was enough of a humbling and fear-inducing experience that as soon as I returned to my tent, I decided my best option, my only option, was to read my Bible. And in doing so, was reminded it was only the Lord who could give me combat calm, strength and hope, presence of mind, and a purposeful ending no matter the outcome like the story of Gideon making clear our absolute need of a Savior. The very Savior, the discipline of Advent, prepares us by humility to accept as our Lord. In the book of Judges, Gideon is weak in chapter 6 because of his inexperience. And then he is weak again in chapter 8 after he has won this battle because of his arrogance making the point that the only true victor and king 
can be God alone. So that as we admit our weaknesses, we come to admit also that our only possible hope is in the Lord. That we are only really made strong in Christ. The Lord says uh, to St. Paul in 2 Corinthians, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So St. Paul then responds, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, in failures. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we should give thanks always uh, as we acknowledge our frailty and our failures because they serve to drive us to conviction and confidence that as for Gideon, so too for us that our ultimate victory will be won by the Lord and not by ourselves. And that truth then becomes the substance of our own witness to his power, grace, and glory. Amen.